Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Good afternoon, everybody. I know this has been a great show. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, listen to what we have to say about navigating technology in the waste and recycling industry. Uh, my name is Evan Schwartz. I'm the head of technology for North America for AMCS Group. Uh, I got the sense that I was asked to do this mostly just to go ahead and apologize up front as a representative of technology uh, of some of the challenges to implement technology, particularly in the waste and recycle industry. We have an amazing panel uh, to talk to you guys today, uh, both from technology sectors as well as technology implementers who've walked this road uh, to give us uh, a bird's eye view of some of the success stories as well as some of the challenges and a really good uh, introspective look into the process. Uh, we're starting to mature in our way of looking at digital transformation and implementing of technology within our business. So we've got some real figures that we can look at to start making decisions. Uh, to my left is Mark Abbas. He is the CMO for AMCS Group. Beside him is Dr. Armin Vogel, and he's the EVP Plastics Corporate Board Member of SSI Schaefer. <coughs> Next, we have Mark Vescovi. He's the CIO of Liberty Tire Recycling. We have beside him is Thomas Toscano, CEO of Mr. T. Carding, and Brian Gimbagno is the CFO of the Action Environmental Group. So we're gonna kick off the session today as people are still funneling in, and uh, Mark Abbas is gonna give us a first look into some of the analytics and how we're beginning to uh, componentize our ability to make decisions uh, for technology for our business. All right, thank you, Evan. I wanted to set the baseline, kind of where are we in the waste industry in terms of digital transformation? How well have we adopted technologies, actually? And um, we decided to do our own research because there's not a lot of research done actually on this. So we did our own research uh, supported by the International Solid Waste Association. And we've issued a report earlier this year talking purely about digital transformation in, this, in the waste and recycling industry. So what we did was actually we researched um, on a couple of areas, right? First of all, in the blue box there, we were, we were looking at the strategy side of things of those waste and recycling companies. So we were talking about what's your priorities in terms of digital strategies, what are the challenges you're facing, what innovations are you looking at, where are you investing your money, all that kind of stuff. Then we also looked at trying to profile those kind of waste companies. So we said, what's the output? What's the efficiency of those companies? So, you know, looking at things like waste per employee, waste per truck, activities per truck, those kind of statistics, we also uh, asked uh, companies to kind of give us that. And, um, and then we ask how important are the several things, you know, the elements of digital transformation, and where are you actually on your roadmap adopting those kind of uh, things, right? So, so then, when we were starting to research that, we, we came up with this model. Because digital transformation isn't about technology alone. I think we all know that. It's a lot more. And who was there in the in, uh, investment sessions yesterday, in the investment uh, summit yesterday, they heard it a lot, like, it's not just about new technologies, it's also about employee engagement. How do we make sure we get our, 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 our employees engaged with the, in this transformation, uh, that they're really going to adopt technologies and, and love using it? Obviously, it needs a, a strong leadership as well to kind of get this ball rolling. But also, you look at the value chain, and you have partners. You've got you, you to collaborate to get this right. So, um, and then you have the whole analytic side of things. So, you know, just looking at your, your, your uh, digital environment and, and turning data into actionable data. So that's kind of the digital transformation model. And I'm going to share a few of the key results just to set the baseline of where we think the industry is. We, we, we queried about 160 organizations around the globe, uh, waste haulers, uh, municipalities as well in this business. And we asked them how, what, about their awareness. 
So we said, you know, the, the, take the digital transformation model there. How aware are you that, you know, what's the urgency? Are you aware we need to do something here? So you see the results here, right? So they're scoring 8.2 on a scale of 1 to 10 on, on employee engagement. That's right at the top of mind of many of these companies. Leadership and culture also high. And you see actually business intelligence, uh, new technologies, 7.4 and 7.3 in the value chain. So I would say that's, that's reasonably, we, we know we know what we need to do. We are aware of what needs to be done. But then, if you look at, you know, have you turned this into actions in your company, that's where you see, start to see a lot of differences. So, so you see like, things like adopting new technologies is scoring a 5.7 on a scale from 1 to 10. And BI scores a 5.9. So you see the gap between the awareness and the ability to act and actually take action, that is kind of gives us a, an idea about the state of the industry. So there's a lot of work to be done. So then let me share a few key findings of the, uh, of the research we did. So we asked the, the, the companies say, okay, why are you actually doing this? Why do you need to go through digital transformation? 74% responded, we do this for customer satisfaction and customer loyalty. Okay, so, so we cannot lose any customers. Customers expect digital experience. We need to, to go there. Right, we need to do it, 74%. 72% close to that said, we, need, we just need technology to be more productive, to be more competitive, you know, to reduce costs and all of that. And then 57 responded like we wanted, we need to build a digital presence. We need to do business in the digital space rather than the old way of doing things. And, and the landscape is changing rapidly, right? So let me give you a few insights of where these companies are actually investing right now some of the technologies they're investing in. So about 50% of the respondents is actually investing in things like route optimization, right, route and route management. Web portal, self-service kind of, you know, building that digital presence, also close to 50%. Fleet activity and fleet tracking, knowing where your vehicles are, what they do, collect all the data you can and make sure and, 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 and use that to kind of drive your uh, improvements and then analyze Actually, are we still making money? Are we doing it the right way? Are we keeping our service levels on the BI side? So this is where they spent their money. So and then, and I think if you're interested, um, you know, we can, we can share the full report with you. So, so we said there's a maturity model. So you, 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 don't go, you don't go from level one to level five and, and be the big star there, be the best in class. It's a, it's a, it's a process that you need to go through as a, as a company. So we kind of built those levels into, uh, uh, into the report. So you can kind of benchmark yourself where you are and you can, you can uh, read about you know, the differences that, uh, or the, the steps that you need to take to kind of progress through the model. So, I just thought it would be interesting to share a little bit of what the best in class are doing. So that's about 15%. So the best in class again is that high priority, they, they are, their awareness is very high, but also their ability to act is really high. Okay, so this is what they do. They spend about 1.8% of their revenue, if they're in a commercial business, on IT. That's about 15% more than the rest of the group. Okay, so, so kind of obvious, but if they think digitalization is important, and actually 95% would agree, 94%, they're actually putting their money where their mouth is. They're investing more in IT. And 35% of the respondents actually spend more than 2% of revenue on IT and technology investment in, uh, innovation. So we see that's, that's, that's shifting. Now, if you look at the bottom right, the green box there, so what, what kind of digital solution are you already using? You know, they have best of breed backend solutions. They got backend software. They got that right. They got tablets in the vehicles. They kind of monitor, um, you know, all the data that's being collected when they're when they're when they're on the road, and they have implemented things like customer self-service and web portals and stuff. They still have their, their challenges. You know, they're still struggling with all this data that they're now collecting. What to do with it? Um, but mainly, these these are fast-growing companies doing a lot of merger and acquisitions. Uh, being the best in class, but also meaning they're, they're rapidly growing. So managing the complexity of, of, of getting bigger is, is one of their challenges that they're looking at, right? And where are they investing in? So the best in class are still investing. So they look things like, like self-service automation, chatbots, kind of having, you know, instead of having um, uh, customer service uh, calls on the, uh, at the back end, you, you, um, 
you, you, you'd use technology like chatbots that are you know, artificial intelligent, are learning, and can have like, conversations with your, uh, with your customers. Also using uh, IVR, which is uh, you know, something like uh, automated uh, voice response uh, system. So kind of have dialogues with your customers uh, rather than, than uh, so have that 24 by seven coverage. And they're, they're looking at auction platforms, subcontractor management, like digitizing, automating that stuff. So my final slide is about the key conclusions, and, and you're, again, you're happy to read the report, but I think some of the key conclusions I take from, the, from this research is that digital transformation definitely requires very strong leadership, right? And interesting enough is that if we ask the respondents, what's your biggest hurdle? Why are you not making progress? They said it's the, the, the classical legis, uh, the, the legacy system that we have in place that's not up for the new technology. So it's, it's kind of in our way. You know, we can't, we, we can't kind of go to the digital world if our, our ERP system is still from the 80s, right? So we have to make progress there, and that's a big hurdle because that's the heart of your system. So that's a tough, tough thing. And then I think, just to conclude, I think it's, it's all about planning your route. This is digital transformation. is not something you just switch on or off. Everyone's aware of that. So it's a, it's a long-term strategy, and you're, you're going you're gonna to have to you know, be prepared to, to have a long-term commitment. You're, 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 you're putting your money into a partner, probably, that's helping you out for the next five, six, seven years, and you have to stick with them because it's hard to get the change. So, so be aware of that and, and, and make the right choice there, right? Choose your right partner. But also be practical. Don't look at it. We've, I've seen it go wrong many times where they say companies were doing, like we've taken this holistically, we're going to do a full implementation and everything's going to, you know, we're going to change everything in one go. That's usually not the right way, the right approach. Or differently, you see that companies are starting off really siloed solutions and they, oh, we do a little bit of this and we're going to be, you know, this is cool, we do an IoT project. But then they forget about looking at what they're actually doing it for. Um, so, so I would say really keep it practical. Like, you know, I, we have all the buzzwords in IoT, keep it practical. Take a certain uh, expertise, take a certain thing like paperless trucks, try to automate that, the whole process flow. Uh, you know, build your digital presence. Take a small step there and then take it from there and build your, in line with your strategy, right, with a, with a, with a solid base there, but, but start small with one of the things that you have a quick kind of uh, win because you really need that to get your people kind of motivated. Um, so then the holistic, so, so look at it holistically. I mean, don't, don't start to change the world at one go, but you've got to keep that in mind. Everything needs to talk to each other, so you've got to look for solutions out there that can communicate to each other, that, are, that can connect, and that's expandable. That's really important. So um, avoid siloed solutions because you will end up, and that's the last point, you don't want to duplicate data in your technology stack because you get, you get lost in the digital world. So, so the connected data points, I think, is the way to ensure data quality. Right? With that, give it back to you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So the next that we're going to hear from is Dr. Vogel. And um, just want to comment on one piece uh, to Mark's presentation before I hand it over. One of the other huge drivers that I see from the back office technology side that keeps bumping up and pushing from an upward pressure perspective of companies to get to a more modern technology, to add technology to their environments, is the ability to recruit personnel. We're seeing increasingly less personnel uh, that are accustomed to what they consider their greatest hurdle, which are their classic systems. Uh, the younger folks coming out of college are used to being able to work from this, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a very strong motivator to considering that in your technology. So let's welcome Dr. Vogel and uh, please continue. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure for me to be here. Um, it's really a challenge in 10 minutes to tell you something uh, about digital change, <laughs> but I think it's fast, so I have to be fast as well. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. Um, sometimes I say um, it's like sex in puberty. Everybody is talking about it, nobody is doing it really, but they think the others are doing it. So, <laughs> and I believe it's important to understand what is it. 
thing, what we are talking about. So for me, first of all, uh, perhaps a little uh, yeah, uh, definition. For me, digitalization is always changing the business model. It's not only technology. We need technology to be able to change the business model. That's what we need to understand if we are talking about digitalization. And we have to understand that this is the key of the success of all these startups and all the companies that have really success in digitalization. What does it mean? So digital revolution is prim uh, primarily a revolution of the business models. It's big data driven. It's not money driven on its own. It's not profit on the operation. It's sometimes only collecting big data and having the big data to be successful. Important is we have to see there is a difference between innovation and disruption. Innovation is keeping your business model alive and makes it more efficient. Disruption is killing your business model, your existing one. And platforms, which are mainly the winners of the uh, digitalizations, they are mainly disruptive. They are not innovative. And it's a, it's a, they are thinking in a different way. They always think from the customer base. They don't think, how can I make my business better? How can I do my product better? And what is my best marketing text to attract a lot of people? No, they think of the unit one. One people they have to attract, but they know him very well. They have all data about him, they have collected it, and they know exactly and precisely what they have to predict with the customer. And at the end, the winner will take it all. There is not a second winner. If you look to search engines, for example, it's only Google. All the others that are existing are minor. If you are looking to the big uh, uh, platforms for selling, it's Amazon. All the others are smaller. They are not the winners. And at the end, one will win. And that's very important. And important is also that we can see it's technology driven and technology is very fast. If you see the technology of the past, uh, I think the figures are a little bit small, but uh, if you see here, um, the, tel the telephone has taken 75 years to get 50 million users. Yeah? Uh, if you look to the internet, that was four years still to get 50 million users. A simple software like Pokemon Go, five days. So uh, that's very fast and we have to understand that this is something where you need to be fast to, to react on this. Uh, a, simple, a simple picture. This is the development of cameras. It has nothing to do with our business, but it shows you how it works. This is a picture of sales figures of cameras. Yeah? Very simple, the gray one are the old ones, yeah? where you have 36 pictures after your holiday, 12 of them were good, the others you could forget. So then you got the compact digital, the blue ones, then you get the digital uh, high uh, speed cameras, you got the mirrorless, and the orange ones are the smartphones a total new business. These are not the camera producers. These are the telephone producers. These are the players. Unfortunately, you can see here, um, the, I cut it at the top, enabled to be scaling. The real figure looks like this. And that is a change in an industry. That is killing a whole industry. You have to understand that. And that went very fast. This has been five years. So. And then you have to understand innovation versus disruption. So we had a vinyl at the music industry, for example. We had the vinyl. Everybody had it. Two sides, yeah? Front side was good, back side, well, okay. <laughs> then we got a tape that was already better, but unfortunately always the moderators in the radio were talking at the last minute. So still we had to pay for the music. If we want music, we had to buy it. We had to pay for each title or what was on the tape. Then the CD came, oh, fantastic. More titles, more scrap, but okay. It was a better quality, the people could smoke on a party, it didn't harm it. Uh, all these things were happening, but it was the same industry, it was the same factory, yeah, a pressing company. For the press the music on vinyl, now they wrote it on CD. Then MP3 came as a player and you could carry your music, but still you had to buy it if you want to be legal. Yeah, and it was the same business model. They offered you music, you had to pay per title a lot of money. So that was all innovative. That was the innovative path. And already the MP3 player was harming the, the, the tape industry, for sure. But then the streaming occurred. Yeah? Spotify, iTunes. And that was disruptive. Because suddenly 
you had access to all music in the world and you could hear, listen to that music you want for one price. That was the same price for the 20 uh, uh, titles that you received on a CD. And you have access. And suddenly the business model in the music industry changed totally. The, the artist got 10% of the sales of the vinyls or of the CDs. Now they are getting 0.0005 cent uh, per title that will be streamed. And this is t totally changing the game. So we have to be careful that this will not happen in our industry. Because some industries are dying. This is a curve of the German video take. Uh, video take means where you can uh, rent a movie. Yeah? This is the gross pass. They die. This is the gross pass of the streaming, the Netflix and so on. And what you can see is very easy. The number of video shops in Germany from 2008 to 2018, from 2,900 to 914. The turnover from the streaming services went from 2010 to 2017 from 114 million euros to 946 million euros. A whole industry was disrupted. And you could see it in Blockbuster. They died early. The biggest video company in the world. Bankrupt. And that is how fast it is. And don't believe that the people at this stage were thinking they are in risk. They, do, they have invested, invested, invested. The people want to come here, they want to see the video and blah, blah, blah. But it was not convenient. And it's all convenient, you know? Uh, I was always wondering. I, I, on Friday, I, I took a video. We wanted to look with the family. On Monday, I had an appointment in the morning, so I couldn't bring it back. I forgot it over the week, and at the weekend, I have to pay $5 more. So is that a business model? Is that nice? No. But with Netflix, I can do whatever I want. And I can stop in between. I can look next week to it, and so on. So if it is convenient for the customer, they accept this. They will accept this. And that is all where we have to uh, think about. And if you think then about what is the fuel of all that, then I can tell you only it's big data. And this is the exploding value of companies. The best example is Nest. You know Nest. This is the thermostat that you put on your wall. With your smartphone, you can log in. You can control your temperature, whatever you want. If you go out and drive one mile, it goes down by one degree or five degrees. And if you go five miles, even more. If you come back, it goes up the temperature. And it learns. It knows every Monday to Friday you are from seven to five out of your home. So it regulates itself. It's not a a uh, huge technology. I think to write the software and to develop it is not a big issue. You can do that. But in Nest Lab was founded in 2010. Yeah? In 2014, it was sold for $3 billion. $3 billion for a thermostat. But why? Big data. Because the people know now when you are at home. Are you somebody who likes to have it warm? You become more predictable with these data. You can sell these data to delivery dates, uh, to delivery companies, yeah? that the parcel comes if you are at home. This is really the value the people are looking for. They have a data model as a business model. They don't have a profit model in terms of what are we doing with our product. Their profit model are the data. And we have to understand that even for waste management, everyone in your country is related to waste management. There is a lot of data you can collect. It's a lot, very attractive thing. Are these people separating material? What kind of material are they uh, uh, consuming? What is in their bin? We will see that with the technology that is growing so fast that we can detect what is in it. We will see that. We will see it quickly. We will, might see it faster than we think. And these are the data that the people want. And then the data model is more valuable than our service in waste management. And if you then see the value proposition, if I talk, if I always say, we will come to service on demand. That's what the people want. That's what the people need. Yeah? If I take my phone now out, I can, if I want, even during my speech, order a pizza. Yeah? I can book my vacation. I can buy a car. Whatever I want. Only this bloody waste management is coming every second week on a Tuesday. Whether I'm at home or not. Yeah? Whether I want them, whether my bin is, st my cart is stinks or whatever. They come. If I'm in holiday, I have bad luck. I have to wait four weeks. So, is that service? Is that really what the people want? And if you talk in this way to waste management companies, they say, yeah, but every day a new route? Every day a different route? Is that possible? 
Can we do that? Can our system do that? But I tell you, others are showing it how it works. Look to companies like Amazon. They are not older than you. They are not older than you. But only at a prime day, one day, they do half a billion turnover. Half a billion dollar at one day. They get 20 million orders and they get 230 orders per second. 230 orders per second, which are all a parcel the next day and they are the next day with you. That is service on demand. That is what they do. But I tell you something. That is a small player if you look to Alibaba. Alibaba is doing at their singles day in China 17.8 billion and they are getting 750 million orders. And that means 7,006 orders per second in the peak 174,000 orders. And this is a parcel the next day. And we are talking, oh, I have to do 10 different bins at that day, the next day. That is really a challenge. <laughs> I tell you. Alibaba, by the way, 2 million in the first two minutes and 2 billion and 32 billion in one day last year, in one day. None of our biggest players in the waste industry are doing the same in the year. You have to understand, and they are not old. They are five years old. So, and how does waste management operate digitalization? We have heard a lot from you already. You know the ISVA uh, survey, where you can see what other people doing, and you can see a lot of things are innovative. Yeah, we are thinking driverless cars, drones, robots, artificial intelligence. But this is all not a new business model. We are not thinking in platforms, for example. We are not thinking in different ways of treating our customers. Our industry, we have, main, we have smart trucks. We have the smart branch where we can do the routing, where we can see the service verification. We have smart bins with filling level sensors, all these things. We are really totally digital, totally digital. But this is only machine-to-machine -machine communication and this is innovative. There's nothing disruptive. We are remaining in our old business model. And the people that are coming with a disruptive model, they are coming from outside the industry. And they are looking, where is the service not very good? Remember, every second week on a Tuesday. I think our service is in a way that we are a perfect target for these disruptors to fight against us. So, is a fixed discharge cycle or a given container size really customer service? Is that customer service? And who is the customer for us? Who is the customer for a waste management company? Is that the municipality? It's not the single person that is using the bin. That is not your customer. The one who is giving the tender out is your customer and you are fulfilling the tender regulation. That is what customer service is for you. You are not thinking about the single user of the bin. For him, it's very hard to communicate. What happens if he wants something with the bin? If he wants an extra emptying? He's in 20 minute hotline at the municipality telling them, no, you have to call your waste hauler. Yeah? So, and they say, yeah, but then you have to call the municipality because you, have, you will get an extra charge. So, this is customer service in our industry. And so, mostly the customer will be attacked in the interface of attraction, where, where it is attractive. And I think this is the most important picture. This is a picture of waste management. You have a lot of lines where the people are coming in, yeah? or here where the people want to be connected with you. And here, this is the digitalization of the process. We are working at the moment in this field. Here we have to be very, very good. We need to be best in class. We have to develop technology in our uh, uh, companies to be best in class, to be able to do service on demand. That's where we need definitely technology. But that is not enough because the disruptor will be here. This is the field where the disruption will happen, where the connection to the customer is. There will be the offer, I make more comfort, I'll give you more comfort, I will m make it more convenient for you. I will have an idea where we cannot think about because we are thinking in our old pattern and we want that everything remains as it is because we are doing the job since 50 years. But there will be somebody who will tell us, at this stage, I'm better in the communication with your customer. Either direct communication by whatever, by apps or something like this. It might be the filling level sensor. It might be a fully new technology where we have to think of. Or there will be new players. I'll give you, and then I think I will finish, uh, nearly 
a last example. Imagine Amazon would say tomorrow, I give 50 cent refund on cardboard. Everybody of us knows cardboard is a very profitable business. Yeah, we like cardboard because you get money for this material. So imagine Amazon would say 50 cent on each cardboard. If you give it back to me, you will get a 50 cent discount on your next purchase on Amazon. So that is customer binding. These 50 cent they can even give as a gift to the last mile haulers, to the UPS and how they are called, to bring the material back. Yeah? Because they are driving back empty, they can do it anyway. So the good thing is they don't need the sorting plant because they get very, very clean material because it's not collected anonymous, it's collected in a face-to-face -face collection so you get good material. Then they get it back and now everybody will say, yeah, but we are coming with a big truck, we compact and we have technology. We are cheaper in collection, we are more competitive with these material. For Amazon it doesn't matter. They say, look, I take now the material, whatever it has cost, and I'll go to my producer of cardboard. He is a commodity maker. So I tell him for the next four million parcels that I need with your cardboard, uh, you have to take my material or I will go to your neighbor. So take it for the price I tell you or I will give the order to somebody else. And you will see them melting in the sun. So I will take that. So, and what is happening? Amazon is writing on their website, we are green, we are driving everything in a cycle. They have more customer binding. They know better about the customer. Is he really separating material? Is he looking for the last 50 cent to get it back? All these things will happen. And they have cheap material for their supplier. But we all, we are not part of the game. I will sell no cars to these guys. We will sell no trucks to these guys. And we are out. And they do the cherry picking. Tomorrow they do that with used clothes, with it's also, also good market, or with e-scrap. So, and then we are out. We are getting only the rest. And that is then under price pressure. So, this is why we as an industry have to think about new business models and about digital transformation. And we have to decide whether we want to be digital or not. If you don't do that, then others will come in the industry. But it's very important. Focus on your customer. Ask what your customer wants. Don't think, what can I do very good and I offer it. Ask what the customer wants that it is convenient for him. And then make it tailor-made. Don't do it like this. Do it like this. Do it as he wants it. Thank you very much. Very good. Well done. So we're going to sort of take an opportunity to address the panel and we're going to talk um, specifically about digital transformation. So the, the question I want to bring to the panel and we can just do a, a raise of hands of who wants to jump on it. So in this era of digital transformation, there are a ton of opportunities. What is the biggest opportunity that you guys have seen in the waste industry? In covered. <laughs> Um, I think a lot of what we just heard is around getting the data as close as we can to the decision maker. The, way, the reason those apps become very popular is because there's a ton of data behind them and it makes it very easy for the consumer. Um, we're finding that our employees, our management, really want to see that data as close as possible. So we're implementing perform manufacturing performance management systems in the sites where the operators can actually make the decision or record the data on why a machine is not working accurately. Um, the GMs can push information to the tablets in a route so that if there is somebody that calls in and says, hey, um, I need my tires picked up today, and by the way, Mark Viscovi, um, tire recycling, that's what we do. Um, if somebody needs their bins full and they need their tires picked up that day and we don't have them on the route until next week, they can call in. We can adjust the route. We can have somebody go pick that up. And we're actually implementing route optimization software so that we can pick the best route to put that um, pickup on. So I think a lot of the digital um, transformation and to me, it's just really business enablement. We're in the business in IT as the CIO to make it easier or as easy as possible for um, our, our business areas to function. Um, it's all around getting that data as close to the decision maker as possible so that it makes their life a lot easier and that's what the GMs are looking for. Whenever we rolled out the tablets, we were, we were 
leery that some of the GMs would, would even want to use it. Now their biggest gripe is that if they don't have signal in an area, they don't hear from the driver whenever they push a route to them, and that's all of a sudden their biggest issue. That's a really great issue to have. So we're seeing it, it's all about that data and pushing it as close to the consumer as possible. Thomas, did you have a Yes, uh, I, I completely agree. For us, the primary driver was, was to gather, gather as much data as possible. We run about 20 routes in New York City, and you turn, when you digitize those trucks and you put computers in those trucks, you turn them in, into data gathering machines. Um, the scales are integrated with the computers themselves. You're getting on the larger accounts. New York City is a bit of a different animal. You get a truck to do three, 400 stops in a night. You cannot possibly weigh up that number of stops in one shot, especially when trucks are stopping and picking up three and four and five stops in one spot. You know, to, to slow them down, you wouldn't do that. But on the larger accounts, the, the container accounts, to get those weights on a consistent basis, and then when you have conversations with those customers about pricing, um, you know, cut, uh, drivers are able to input things like the contamination level and the recycling, uh, not outs. I, one of the things that amazed me when we got this system, um, when, when you hit not out, it takes a 360 degree picture around the truck. And the next day, customers would call in and say, hey, you never picked up my garbage. You know how many of those customers, the garbage was not out. You know, and we never realized this until we got this system because you know, now you're giving the customer via email a picture of the front of their store at 3.45 a.m. showing there's no garbage out and it completely changes the conversation. You know, so you know, just being able to troubleshoot those things and pricing, the, the, that, that was the most important to us. Okay, Brian? Repeating everything everybody else said. It, okay. For us, it's, it's operational efficiency. It's getting that data. It's big data. Um, we're, we're also in New York City. We're New Jersey, New York City. We run about 350 trucks a day. Uh, we have implemented route optimization as well as tablets within our, our vehicles. So we know where the trucks are every time there's a, a hard break, every time there's a, any type of movement. Um, cameras in the truck, outside the truck. We're feeding all of that data. So it's, it's operational, it's safety metrics, it's um, payroll metrics. And then what we've taken a step further, on top of all of our systems, we implemented a data warehouse. So we have dashboards that are real-time data feeding from all of our operating systems, payroll, GL, um, that right from, you know, we say from the street to the executive boardroom. Right. We, have, we have daily, daily um, weekly, quarterly metrics. Mm -hmm. So we, we've identified the best opportunity in organizations and you guys attacked those, right? And you've really optimized them. But from an important standpoint, from a leadership down in your company, how important is digital transformation to your companies? Brian, we'll start with you this time. I think it's critical. Um, I just find in our industry changes is a little slow. Um, so we need to get buy-in from the end users. So as we're implementing new technology, we need to get down and have the end user a part of the decision-making process and get their buy-in early. Um, you know, some of our businesses were second, third generation garbage guys, and now we're asking, asking them to embr embrace technology, um, which, is, which is new. Um, so what we also needed to do was you can't just hand technology to the guys and expect them to run with it. Right. Right? We've had to pull people out and, and have a champion and have that champion really embrace the technology. Take him out of his day job and have him, um, I think Mark mentioned it, get those small wins. Like when we implemented our, our um, onboard computers, we didn't do a big bang. We didn't ro roll out 300 units at once. Right. We broke it down in maybe a dozen units at a time. Uh, we did New Jersey first. We did front load first to get the momentum so that um, the guys can start to embrace it. We even went down to the point of, um, as Tom mentioned, we have cameras on the system, and you pull up to a four-yard box that's overloaded, take a picture of that overloaded box, it then integrates back into our C uh, customer service system and billing, we can then bill extras. We went to the, to the extent of actually commissioning the driver on the extras that yeah. we can bill for. So we're getting the buy-in right at the driver on, on the street. The drivers to us were the most important in buy-in, and I know this is probably not going to shock anybody, but there's almost an inverse relationship between age and how quickly they, they you know, embrace the system. 
Um, but in attracting new talent, I use this as a sales feature because we're, we're us in action. I don't think there's anybody else in the city that's actually using these computers right now. And the millennials, this generation, they grew up on the machines. And to you know, instead of having paper that they're checking off on these antiquated systems, our old system used to have these little tickets that they fill out. That I hated those things. I'm still gonna have. I got box of them in my, my back room. We're gonna have a bonfire one one August <laughs> night in the in the parking lot to, to get rid of all those those tickets. But you know, to to show them you know touchscreen computers in these trucks, which are already really cool pieces of equipment. I mean, these these are things that just about every little boy played with when he was you know five, six, seven years old. And throw in a computer in there, and, and, and I think it, it's really, really important in helping attract talent to the next generation of drivers. Perfect. Mark? You I, that was funny just hearing garbage trucks are really cool trucks. <laughs> uh, you know, most people wouldn't view that, right? Um, yeah. But uh, I would say at the CEO level, um, one, of the, one of the key indicators to me is that um, I've been with Liberty for a year, and whenever I came on, um, the previous my predecessor was the VP of business implementation or innovation or something. It was a VP, he reported to the CFO and the CFO reported to the CEO. Whenever I came in, it was CIO and it reports directly to the CEO. And his mission to me was, you've been in IT for 30 years, I'm a garbage guy, or I'm a garbage guy. I've been a garbage guy all my life, I collect tires, that's what I do. He's like, you run with things and, and you do what you need to do. Um, he's empowered me to make the decisions. Wow. Um, I've given him the metrics necessary for him to know that I'm doing my job as best I can. And you know that says tons to me because he's made that decision and he's, he's trusted it that it's gonna be successful and he's empowered me to implement new things and he's actually come up with models to say, if you do this, here's your financial gain. We're tying it to the ROI of the business, so if I implement the route optimization, this is what it means to me. Talk about motivation. For real. So Mark, to start with you, um, when you look back at what you've done from the best uh, opportunity and you've looked at how you've implemented it, where would you say your company is from a transformation standpoint? How much more do you have to go? What are you guys currently looking at? What are those areas you see for opportunities for improvement? Oh, I, I looked at the first year as sort of getting my legs underneath me and putting some infrastructure in place. Um, we had a lot of antiquated technology running Windows 2008, Easy wins, old right? system. That was year one and cleaning up the system because Liberty was formed of a merger of 30 plus companies wow. in the US and Canada. So there was just a lot of old stuff laying around. Um, so that was cleaning it up and the first direction was implement the handhelds. It was a six month project that really had gone nowhere. Um, and one of the RVPs said, this is the one thing that you can do that'll really make a difference so we spent four months in implementing the the tablets for the tire collection getting that rolled out um, and I think that's one of the big successes in year one um, route optimization the manufacturing component where we can see real time in the in the plants um, the performance of the machines the downtime of the machines and start to use lean six sigma and Pareto charts to be able to say here's where our biggest opportunities and then um, managed maintenance and those are some of the big projects that we have going on. Hopefully 2019 is gonna be a big implementation of pilots for that, and then 2020 we'll be rolling that out to the entire company. Wow, Thomas? So it's aggressive. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna answer this two ways. I don't think the, the job is ever done. I mean, there's always new technologies, there's always new opportunities coming out, so, so you know, but you know, our big project of implementing the, the you know the computerization of the trucks and implementing that with billing and completely automating that process we're about seventy percent done and that's taken three years to get there so I'm I'm thinking about another year to finish you know the biggest deal for us is going to be putting RFID chips in the containers and that so so on that on that side of it it's uh, but but overall company digitalization. Uh, new opportunities, uh, changing with the times, that never ends. That's why, I think that's why we're all here. So. Right. Can I, can I respond to that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. sorry, yeah. So, I, I think that's a good point. Um, I, I think it's also crucial to build an agile business because 
the pace of change in this industry is, going to, is rapidly increasing, right? There's new technology tomorrow, there's new technology the day after. And, and you got to think about also, so from a technology side, you, you want to implement those changes fast, but also business models wise. Like if Mark is having you know, a tough um, kind of uh, month uh, b because there's a lot of competition and they, he wants to have a new business model and implement that right this week and not have to wait like for a month or a year to kind of roll that out. So, so I just want to underline the, the importance of agility. So there's not just one size fits all today and it will be still there like next month. We got to have an agile business um, also and supported by, by agile technology. Mm -hmm. Right. And for us, I, I, it's similar in that uh, getting the tablets on the computer was critical. There's so much data and we're in a good spot now where we are capturing a lot of data, converting that data into information and actionable items. Right. And getting that, um, you know, we talk about safety, service, and sales. And we have our key metrics behind safety, service, and sales. And we've got the data. Now it's all about execution. What do we do with that data? And get, get out in front and pre, be more preventive, be more predictive with our data. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to allow, um, allow, we're going to invite our other three <laughs> panelists to come up and uh, say a little bit about their business and some of their experience specifically. We've heard quite a bit, um, but we'll let them talk. I'm Mark Vescovi, CIO, Liberty Tire, that sort of speaks for itself. Um, Bio joined Liberty Tire February of last year. Um, interesting story. Um, was hired two days before anybody knew that I joined, and the first thing the CEO asked me to do was go ride in a truck. He's like, you ride in a truck, people will respect you day one, it'll go like wildfire throughout the company, that will build who you are with the company. So um, our CEO has a great perspective of the, the people that he's that work within the organization, um, that says volumes because people still actually come up to me at times and say, hey, you were the guy that rode the truck. Um, and then the next was go to a plant to, to understand the business um, and really get ingrained in, in what Liberty does. Um, held various positions in IT. I worked for Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield for 22 years. Before that, I was in manufacturing and I was in finance for two short stints. Spent a lot of time in healthcare. And um, if you wanna talk about business digitalization and disruption, um, that's an industry that's got it both hands down over the last 10, 20 years. You'd be amazed the company that whenever I started to, to whenever I left. Um, Business deg or a bachelor's degree from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Also did um, project management degree at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh and advanced certificates from MIT in Six Sigma Lean process improvement. A um, little bit about Liberty Tire and what Liberty does. Um, it's really full life cycle. It's tire collection, we pick them up. We grade the tires to say, hey, we can recycle these tires, sell these tires, then we process what's left. We grind it up, we take the wire out of the tires, we take the fiber out of the tires, we grind the tires down into um, as small a, small a thing as a pencil point. Um, you see the crumb that's in the fields whenever your kids are playing soccer or football, that comes from us. You see mulch on the playgrounds, that comes from us. We sell the wire, recycle the wire, um, we, we do the whole thing, so it's from pickup and um, to actually delivery and sales. Um, Fast Facts, the company was founded in 2000. I mentioned um, around 30 companies or a group of guys, one of them. Um, if you, anybody, anybody in here a Steelers fan? No? From Pittsburgh, Steelers fan. Um, Andy Russell was a linebacker for the Steelers in the 70s. He's one of the founders of the company. Those three guys purchased a bunch of companies and um, you know, made Liberty Tire. Um, processed about 150 million tires, producing $2.2 billion worth of rubber a year. And the 1,500 employees, we purchased a distribution, a, a company that sells mulch as well as other home and garden goods. Um, IMC Outdoor living, living in November of last year. That number's more like 2,000 at this point in time. And then I already covered much of the products. Um, one of the things that we're coming out with shortly is um, we've always had um, rubberized um, 
asphalt, but now we have a product that you can actually mix on site that we think is gonna be much more attractive to the asphalt industry because it used to be a huge pain in the ass to actually do rubberized mulch. This is gonna be much easier. Um, digital transformation, I covered a couple of these things. Um, we had the Android deployment in 2018. Um, that was, I would say, pretty successful. Um, we have route optimization in 2019. Um, we're gonna do a small pilot with three sites. And then once we get that underneath our belt, we're gonna try to use it to self-fund the rest of the sites. So if we can't get enough um, return on investment in those three sites to do more sites, we're not gonna go any further than those three. And I think that's doing things with a business sense in mind. The original uh, plan was to roll it out to 20 different sites. We said, or I said, nope, we're not gonna do it that way. Let's try three, let's get that done. And then once we get that, then we'll roll it out to the others. Um, and manufacturing excellence, um, today we have a lot of um, issues with heat in the plants and if anybody, you guys know rubber, heat and rubber, not really a good mix. Our biggest, um, our biggest issue is fires. Fires are very detrimental, so part of the manufacturing excellence is not only to measure the machines and the output, but also to ma ma measure the temperature and actually add water. We have fire um, devices that, that trigger automatically. And then the last thing in digital transformation is we have an inventory system that currently has a mini computer with a touch screen. Um, we're looking to transition to tablets. And one of the main reasons I was in our Baltimore plant last week, um, the, the driver has to get off the forklift to go over whenever they weigh a device to enter it into the inventory sy system to print a slip. If we can get them on the tablets, we can mount them on the forklift. They weigh the device, they enter the information in. Um, that's, a, that's a business benefit, but also the tablet devices are like 200 bucks. The screen and the computer together are like 800, $1,000, so we can actually have some cost savings with that as well. Then the last slide is we talked about um, metrics and the big data aspect of things. This was one of the biggest successes for the Android rollout. It was producing metrics. Um, it was astonishing. We were two months into the implementation and the guy that's been dealing with the handhelds for the last four or five years, he didn't know how many sites actually used the old devices. And I said, we have to have this information. So we worked with um, the, the vendor. We pulled the information out so we could do it multi-dimensionally. We could compare the sites across each other. We could compare month to month. And and if you look at the, the charts, we're actually at, I think it's 87% of um, automation at this point in time. So we only have 13% paper. That's the lowest it's been in two years. And one of the reasons is we produce these metrics, we send them out to the, all of the RVPs, the GMs and the dispatchers every Monday, and they know how they compare against everybody else. And now all of a sudden the RVPs are calling my folks and saying, how can I get more penetration? with these devices. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Brian? Brian, I believe you're next up. <clears throat> Brief, I only have a few slides. Uh, I'm Brian Jambagno, CFO of Action Environmental Group. Action is based in Teaneck, New Jersey, but we're actually New York City's largest uh, solid waste hauler and recycler. We service Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden, Empire State Building to 15,000 restaurants, shops, bodegas, um, major hospitals. We also operate under a different brand, Interstate Waste. Interstate is New Jersey, if geographically kind of Newark North is best how I describe it, and lower New York State. From a technology, technology perspective, for me, it's all about efficiency. It's about integration. Um, since I joined the company, we've done about 19 acquisitions. We get those, the companies onto our systems, our platforms, usually within 30 to 60 days post-closing, so that we're getting that data and, and knowing what the acquisitions look like. Um, we're a metrics-driven organization, as I mentioned. You know, we all have our dashboards. Um, there's a lot, a lot of data. Actually, when I joined the company, I was kind of surprised, mid-market sized business, I was surprised how much data we actually had. And we've spent the past number of years actually putting that data to work. And I just want to show one slide. It's kind of our 
it's a finance guy's version of a, a technology slide. Um, as CFO, I have IT reporting to me, so I have the information technology and the systems group reporting to me. In the center really is the hub. That's our operating system. That's where we're capturing all of our operational data. 40-something thousand customers, 350 routes, um, 12 transfer stations, two, three MRFs, um, et cetera. All that data is captured real time in, this, in, this, in that hub. As we were talking this time, and I mentioned, we, we've implemented onboard computers. So to date, we've got about 250 trucks running with a tablet in, in the vehicle, capturing all kind of real-time information from where that truck is, you've got the breadcrumb trail, you've got you know, how, how fast is he going down Route 80 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon kind of thing. Um, we've got cameras on that system to take pictures of extras, which interface back into the operating system, which is then available for customer service and billing. It was a huge, huge step, um, and it's a great amount of information. Even something as simple as, as Tom mentioned, in New York City, our guys have pick about three to 400 stops in a given night. They're using paper route sheets, right? You're adding new customers, you're deleting customers, who's on vacation hold, who's on credit hold, and you've got drivers in the middle of the night flipping through paper route sheets. Now you've got turn-by-turn -turn direction, and, and they know exactly where they're going, who, who they have to pick up or, or not. On the other side is route optimization. That's something that's new. We, we kicked that off in January of this year. And that's, once again, it's interfaced with our, our operating system where we're pulling data out. And then we put it into the system, and you spit, sit and spend time putting all the parameters. I have a school zone. I have a time stop. Um, where's my disposal outlet? And then running algorithms to say, what's the best way to run that route? Or throw multiple routes in, and maybe we can optimize. Maybe I could take six routes down to five. And you think about the labor savings, the, the truck savings. So that's a new one. I, I see that's a huge, huge opportunity for us going forward. Um, then we also have our basic general ledger system. We have HRIS. We've got our vehicle maintenance. And actually, what's not on the slide is our safety systems. We capture a lot of, lot of uh, risk and safety information from incidents to claims to violations. All that data is captured. Um, and then for me personally, I think the home run here and the real bang for the buck is at the top is our analytics, where we implemented a data warehouse. Um, sitting in my hotel room this morning, I was able to take a look at my cash receipts from yesterday, my DSOs, I can look at my safety incidents, my uh, overtime from yesterday. Um, the team's working on our April close. I was able to kind of take a peek at um, where the April numbers are coming out, all from our dashboard. Also, I don't have to log into my general ledger. I don't have to log into the vehicle maintenance system. I don't have to log into our operating system. I have all that data in one place available for me, and not just for me, from the executives all the way down to the, uh, the, down to the street, as we said. So that's kind of the finance guy's vision of our technology. Thomas? I'll try not to cover anything that we already did. Uh, I'm, I'm the CEO of Mr. T. Carding Corporation. It's a family business. It's been in existence for over 70 years. Um, I am the third generation, and I've been CEO now for a little over a year and a half. Before that, I was in the CFO position, and I was responsible for implementing the routing optimization, not the optimization, the routing uh, digi digitization that we've been talking about in the computers and the trucks. Um, I put this slide up here because I think it's really important if you're going to do this, before you do it, just because technology can do it doesn't mean you should. And you really should look at in your organization what you're trying to accomplish. And for us, it was you know, some of the things we talked about already, the, the eliminating paper routing, being able to dynamically move stops between routes, um, real-time tracking of what's done, what's not done, eliminating missed pickups. Um, we wanted to gather, as I said before, data, a, a lot of data on customers, ongoing surveys. We knew we couldn't do it for 100 percent, but so our goal was 40 percent. We wanted to automate the billing from routing so that you didn't have these little tickets coming back and, and people keying in in the office. Uh, we wanted to be able to track our equipment. As I mentioned before, that's one of the things that, that, that's not done. And then the millennial talent, and I'll put up this little slide. The, um, to show you, this is this is our future generation. As I said, they grew, they they grew up on the machines, and um, so it really it, it definitely does make a difference. Um, 
And so for us, this is, this is about where we are. The route lists are gone. Um, large accounts are continually surveyed. Drivers are inputting notes, which is great. It's great for the, for the uh, recycling, especially with contamination. Um, not outs have pictures. I mentioned that before. That was sort of, that wasn't one of our goals, but that was one of the things that was a really pleasant surprise, that a lot of our missed pickups were not missed pickups. Um, the younger generation does like the technology. It is easy to change routes. Our system has something called proximity mode, and I want to pause here because a lot has been said about route optimization, and I'm not obviously against route optimization, but as everybody knows, this is a very tight labor market, and it's very tough to attract talent into this industry. And I think that one of the selling points, and whenever they study job satisfaction, one of the things that always comes back is autonomy, you know, the ability to basically do what you, you know, do. and this is one of the few blue collar jobs where you send a guy out with a truck and you basically give him a route and a sheet and he's sort of in charge of his own destiny. Um, and not to be sexist, there are, there actually are a couple of women in, in working in New York City now on these routes. But to, to take a route optimization program, you know, if you're going to do it, talk to them. You know, ask them, would it look good to do the route this way? Because to, to sit there and say, to, get, to give a guy who's done his route his way all his life, you know, and, and when he's 40, 50, 50, even older than that in some of our routes, and to tell him, you're not doing it that way anymore, you're doing it this way. I, I think it takes away a, a, a part of the job that, that, again, attracts them to it. So just, just be careful with that. Um, route metrics are automated, miles, tons, uh, and again, this, this goes to, to what Brian had said before. The, we have a few things that, that are, have not um, been you know, fully implemented, and that's container tracking. That's a big project um, that we're going to have to send people out to actually put RFID chips on every single container. Fortunately, only about 15% of our business is containerized. Um, billing is not yet automated. That's the talking between our billing program and the and the, uh, the program we're using the trucks is, is that's one of the, the last hurdles. And the system has trouble tracking mileage, which I found kind of interesting. But, but other than that, overall, like I said, it's about 70% done this project. And uh, you know, overall, we're happy with it. So. I've, I've got uh, one more question, and I just want to focus on a comment that Thomas had brought up with his slide. When you approach technology, and this is me selfishly standing up here and grandstanding for a minute, uh, being the head of technology, what I often get is, go and implement this. We want this technology. But what I never have is a success criteria. Why do you want that technology? Um, I believe he brought up, make sure you understand what your goals and objectives are. Why, what's your success level in going to that technology? But that also being said, once you understand and you have a clear objective site, um, a lot of the companies that we deal with have to have a technology partner to get them to that goal. So my question to the panel, and uh, Mark, we'll start with you. What is, and we'll want to go through this quickly, so it just if you can boil it down to just one sentence, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> what is a key attribute that you look for in a technology partner to help you succeed in applying technology? I could boil it down to probably one word, okay, um, and then I can elaborate on that word. I'll Fair enough. Um, I would say partner. To me, that's the fundamental word because sometimes you get the technology companies that come in and they say they want to be your partner, but then they want to tell you how to do it. I've had two instances where we've worked with vendors and we said, yeah, we appreciate that's the way you've done it every place else, but that we don't think it's going to work here. Right. You need to change it over here, and both of those vendors have done it, and that's a partner to me. Gotcha. Thomas? Adaptability. Um, my biggest issue was New York City is very different than most other areas of the country. We have very little automation. Everything is, is bags, and, and you know, so so the ability to be able to change the program with the with the vendor to adapt to that type of environment was really important to me. Perfect, Brian. Two words. One is partner. I don't want a vendor. I don't want to just buy software. I need a partner that that's invested in my success and, and interested in my success and support. Uh, Tom brings up a real good point. Right. There's, there's, it's ever changing here, and you know, we live. We're in a regulated industry in New York City, and 
and we've got to get data. We've got to report our customer register to the to the regulators every well, say every three months now. You know, we need the support of our vendors to be able to capture that and be able to report. Right. Just a simple example, um, but support. Be there for us. That's like a partner. Thank you, panel. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well done. Painless. Yeah.